Benvenuti a tutti. Welcome everyone. We thank His Eminence, the Cardinal Gualtiero Bassetti, President of CE, the Episcopal Conference of Italy. We thank him for accepting our invitation to the 40th edition of the Rimini meeting. Don't let anyone steal your dreams, they are your future. This is the title of today's conference. This is not only a title, but also a way to understand uh, Pope Francis's message of last August at the Circus Maximus with 50,000 young people. And I'm quoting, dreams are important. They keep our view broad. They help us to embrace the horizon, to cultivate hope in every daily action. They are the most luminous stars those that indicate a different path for humanity. So you have these brilliant stars, which are your dreams in your heart. They are your responsibility and your treasure and your talent. When I read Pope Francis's message, I immediately thought, of the young women I live with. My name is Matteo and I live in Uganda, in Kampala, where more than 2,000 actually women are tribe in the northern part of Uganda. After 20 years of civil war, were forced to, uh, to flee. After going through any kind of possible suffering and violence, so they found shelter in Kampala, but no one welcomed them until they found a gaze in the night, a light in the shadows, a nurse called Rose. She met these women and they started a wonderful journey with her, a dream, as Pope Francis would say. These women um, break rocks every single day for 80 cents per day. And they, in 2009, decided to start to realize their dream, to fulfill their dreams. Thanks to the very deep love of Rose, they rediscovered who they really are and decided to create a place where their children could fulfill their dreams, where they could find their real identity and understand that they are loved and belong to something. So this is why they built a school. After uh, creating 48,000 uh, necklaces with recycled paper with the help of APSI, and they used all the money to build maybe the most beautiful and serious school in of the whole East Africa, the Luigi Giussani High School. So it's incredible to see how, thanks to love, a dream can become a shared responsibility, a social responsibility. Pope Francis continues. Great dreams create new life. And great dreams, to remain so, need an inexhaustible source of hope, of an infinite that blows within and expands them. Great dreams need God, so as not to become mirages or delusions of omnipotence. This source of hope I call these women mothers, moms, because within this love, everything belongs to us, and I belong to them, and they belong to me. In 2005, the Hurricane Katrina destroyed New Orleans, and out of love, 
These women went up to Rose and said, we want to help our American friends. They don't even know where New Orleans is, but love has no boundaries. They don't even know where America is. But they said, we are moved because these men belong to us. Let's collect money. So they went to the city. They collected money, broke rocks. They collected $1,200 and sent them to America for only one reason. You cannot give what you don't have. You only give what you have. Someone who's loved gives themselves. That's the only thing they can give. Or in 2009, earthquake in the city of Aquila. These women were so tenacious that they said, our Italian, our Italian tribe is suffering. But why did they say Italian tribe? Because they see everything as tribes. And Italy is just one tribe, the one belonging to the Pope. So they belong to the same tribe as the one belonging to the Pope. They said, we want to help the suffering land of Italy. Italians are good at everything, but no one breaks rocks like us. Rose, give us three buses. Let's leave tonight. Let's go to Italy. And let's help our Italian friends find their loved ones under the debris. But Rose said, well, we cannot get to Italy by bus. And these women moved by this dream this room whereby the whole world belongs to them. They said, okay, we'll break the rocks, we'll ask for money. And they collected 2,000 euros to help the city of L'Aquila. This is the kind of dreams I mean when, and I, I see when I hear Pope Francis talking. like these women show us when we belong to something every dream becomes a responsibility this young girl asked i asked her how old are you and she answered well officially i'm 18 but they don't have any registers in in africa so she said officially i'm 18 but actually i'm five because my life started on the 26th of February 2018 at 8.05. It was Wednesday. She even remembered the day of the week. It's my first day of school at the Luigi Giussani High School. I had come to school without any will to live. I had already tried to commit suicide because the people that were supposed to love me, like my father, didn't love me. So the head of the school took me to class and the first hour teacher welcomed me with a beautiful smile. No one had ever smiled to me like that in 14 years. So much so that I turned around to check whether she was smiling to someone else or not. And the headmaster instead looked at me saying, no, she's really looking at you. And then they asked me what uh, what my name was. This had never happened. So this is why I was born that day, that instant. I realized I am an infinite. I am worth of life that day. That's when my dream started. So now I can say that I want to teach, to show the truth and the beauty that I found. So, His Eminence, Cardinal Bassetti, I'd like to give you the floor now. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your help during times like this in a liquid society like this, where when Pope Francis constantly repeats, you young people, but I would add each one of us with a young heart. Pope Francis says, all of us should not um, just sit on the sofa. We are not pensioners. We cannot retire from life, even though we think sometimes that we can do this. Pope Francis says, 
I can find myself only by looking for the good, the truth, the beauty. That's where we can find ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your introduction. Generally, Pope Francis, at the end of every speech, he's, he always says, pray for me. I would like to begin by saying, please pray for me for this difficult mission that I have to bear on my uh, weak shoulders and also that the Holy Spirit can inspire me to say something that can be useful for your life. I found a very beautiful passage by Thomas Mann Joseph and his brothers, which speaks about the gift of the son who is a dreamer. Jacob turns to the son, the lost son, which had who had been sold to Egyptian merchants by his brothers, who is his envious brothers. He thought that he had been killed by a wild beast. He sings, you son favored by a bold heart for the sake of the only beloved wife who lived in you. This was Rachel uh, who had died during childbirth and with whose eyes you gazed just as she once gazed at me beside the well when she first appeared among Laban's sheep and I rolled the cover away for her. I was permitted to kiss her and the shepherds rejoiced singing Lou, Lou, Lou. In you, my darling, I clung to her when the Almighty tore her from me. She dwelt in your charms and what is sweeter than what is double and mutable? In other words, he sees in this younger son to whom then he will gift a tunic with long sleeves precisely to remind himself of his wife talks to his son Joseph and that's the dreamer Joseph was a dreamer and even for his brother he becomes for his brothers sorry he becomes a gift Joseph became who he was he even became vice king of Egypt because of his dreams. That's, that was how the Lord talked to him. And he welcomed and accepted these dreams. Thanks to such dreams, he saved his own brothers and his family. Even when they had to face incredibly hard times when they left for Egypt and even though they were afraid because they didn't know what would happen. Even at that point, he, Joseph said, I'm your brother, Joseph, and what happened in my life happened for your own salvation. This is incredibly beautiful because he 
um, looks at his own experience and believes that everything aims at saving his own brothers. If we had dreams like Joseph did and we could say, yes, everything that's happened in my life is for my own good, that would be just incredible. And especially if we could say, this is all for the good of my brothers. Joseph is a dreamer and he has never let anyone steal his dreams because he understood that his dreams were his future. And what Pope Francis continues to repeat to all of us, and that especially what he wrote in the apostolic letter at the Synod for Young People, don't let anyone steal your dreams or your future, your hope for the future. These are the most beautiful things with which we can arm ourselves for they bring us to the future. And so dreams and hope, which brings us to the future. Having this introduction is not written on the, the speech that I had prepared for you. But when I found this passage uh, by Mann, I was really moved, very struck, because I found a very fitting point for the reflection of today. So the Pope says, God is the author of youth and he operates in every, he works in every young person. Youth is a blessed time. It is a joy, a song of hope. An old person like the Pope and myself, if we say something like, if, if we utter words like this, this means that something within us is burning a song of hope, a blessedness. Why should we consider youth as a, uh, a moment, a passing moment, a transitional period during our life, like any other transitional moment during our life? And we, and we don't realize that this is a determining moment, a turning, uh, a determining moment, a very important moment of our lives. It's a huge time for richness. I not only met Pope Francis, but also Pope Paul VI after 53 years of priest of the priesthood. Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis, these are the popes that I am particularly attached to. And they innovated the evangelic, the message of the gospels in a new way, each of them. So Pope Francis said to the young people. He said, in, in toil, in difficulty, there is a light. And I would like to repeat this and underline this from much suffering, from many different problems which in various ways at, uh, affect you, you must remember these pro pro this affirmation. Within your torment, 
there is an element, there is a source of light. Dear friends, clearly after this long introduction, I promise I won't, uh, I will shorten my, my original talk. Don't let anyone steal your dreams because they are your future. I give a warm welcome to the organizers. Earlier, I said that at the meeting, I was, at, I had never been to the meeting before. In 1971, so when the meeting began, I had never be, I never started until the 70s. I w uh, warmly accepted with great enthusiasm this invitation to speak here today. Once more, don't let anyone steal your dreams. They are the future. This is a beautiful title, which represents a type, a challenge for young people especially. It might make you think of uh, maybe carelessness of a, a, or it could be interpreted from a career point of view. But it is not, this is not what it is. It is a much higher claim. You are called to a, to a destination of which we can find the coordinates in the uh, post-synodal exhortation, Christus Vivit. I really enjoyed that synod. I don't know if any of you participated. Uh, you, Matteo, were present. That huge, immense hall and the great crowd of young people and the purple uh, clothes of the bishops. And at the top, the pope who observed attentively and looked down on, looked across the hall. And many problems were uh, emerging, but at the same time, this source of light was also evident. Let's not forget it. It is a huge gift to us. If you have lost your inner vitality, vitality, your dreams, your enthusiasm, your optimism, and your generosity, Jesus stands before you as once he stood before the dead son of the widow. And with all the power of his resurrection, he urges you, young man, I say to you, arise. I think that this morning, morning, I would like to get everyone to arise from their sleep, for, from everyone's sleep. We have the chance to wake up from our sleep, from our suffering. Because Christ lives, as the Pope says. Christ is the most beautiful experience of this world. Everything, which, everything that is touched by Christ becomes new, is, becomes full of life. He lives and he wants you to live. These are not words. These are, this is an experience of life being communicated. Like uh, Peter and John in front of the paralytic, they don't 
need either silver or gold, but they have Christ. Christ who is living, who is present. The same Christ of which the Pope speaks to us this morning. I also would like to mention a story which highlights three aspects which are essential for our life. Uh, hope, faith, and concreteness. It is quite usual, instead of letting young people speak themselves, it is usual to uh, speak to them with a uh, dense language, with in good faith, but with little attention to their concrete life. And especially with uh, a, s a small sense of responsibility, an insufficient sense of responsibility towards you young people. When I speak of concrete life, I am referring to a, f a full life in which the spiritual dimension has an important part to play, but that does not uh, nullify the importance of dreams and the necessity to help others. Dream, to dream like Joseph the Jew and the person who helped, the, and the Samaritan. I always quote the Good Samaritan parable. We help those who are in need, especially, and we, we kneel down to the people that are wounded on the street. I would also, I would like to remind you, and I don't want my words to be vague and abstract, the example of a great woman who a couple of days ago left us but had, was the uh, exemplification of faith and had the capacity, the ability to dream and to help s young women and small children. She was the founder of the Center of Help of Manjagalli of Milan, and she was able to bring a smile to, w to mothers and to give life to their children. I would like to say on behalf of myself and of all the church, thank you, Paola Bonzi, for everything that you have done. The ability to go towards our neighbor is not in opposition to the ability to dream. Actually, they are quite linked and they are kept together by the joy of following Jesus. The desire for personal success and for possessing huge amounts of money and wealth are the great myths of our society. More than any other political ideology, young generations risk are at risk of being attracted by this nihilistic materialism without any uh, care or attention towards the other who is suffering for the suffering other and without any plan for the future. Today, many young people who are conditioned by this hedonist society, which too often makes 
friendship and human relationships uh, reduces their value. These young people are brought to live individualist in an individualistic way. But in fact, I can only be happy if I am in, re in a relationship with someone else, as the Trinity is in a relationship. The Trinity res represents a relationship. This, in my opinion, is an, a fundamental point. We must claim the, imp the, the concept of relationship back. Because it is only through relationships that you young people can become part of a living body, of a family, of a school, an association, an ecclesiastical community. And when I mean relation, when I say relationship, I am talking about the three dimensions of relationship. First of all, the relationship with the body. This is the first form of relationship that we have with ourselves and with others. Through the body, we understand, we learn how to know ourselves and understand who we have in front of us. We understand uh, the difference between man and woman, the morphological differences, for example, the color of your skin. In a school, in a school uh, where I spoke once, there was a, a small black girl and she began to cry. And I asked her what her name was and she said, what? She said, my name is Luna. What's wrong with you, Luna? I asked. I'm sad. Why? Because all the, everybody else is white and I am not. Why did God create me this way? And so the um, teacher began to give all the scientific explanations because she comes from Africa. And then I said, no, 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 no need. Uh, be quiet. This is just more, conf this is making things more complicated than it should be. I will answer to this little girl. When I walk through these beautiful valleys in Umbria and I see a field of white daisies, after a while, I, I'm surprised, but then I start to get used to it and I become a little bored. And then I see some, I see sunflowers and I'm surprised once more. And then when I go to Castellucha and above Norcia, and there, there's a beautiful valley where Zifirelli, uh directed brother, son, and sister, moon. I see a million colors and I smell uh, a million smells. This diversity is the, is the greatness of God's creation. God loves our diversity and he loves all our colors in a way that you cannot imagine. And the little girl began to smile again. Secondly, interpersonal relationships through relating to other people, every person becomes a member of a living body, part of a family, of a civil community, of a school, of an association, or of an ecclesiastic community. As Thomas Merton said, no man is an island, entire of itself, 
Every man is a piece of a continent, a part of the main. Thomas Merton says that every man is a piece of a continent. So this Trappist monk from the United States is asking us to recognize that every man and every woman, out of love of God, that, man, that they are not alone, but part of an uh, entire humanity, the, the wider humanity. If I, by the, if I, when I use the word part, I am, I could compare that to the part of a cake, for example, but a fragment, a fragment has within itself a piece of everything. It, so there is a semantic difference between piece and fragment. We are a fragment of the Trinity. Why? Because man is the image of God and contains within himself the depth of reality. We are not simply a part of the Trinity, we are a fragment of the, fr the Trinity. We are this fragment which constitutes a huge whole of humanity. Thirdly, relationship with the transcendent and with the church. We have the great problem of modern times, the relationship with God, with faith. And this problem is very evident to me, of course. I'm old, but I live in this world and I'm very aware of it. The relationship between you young people and the church is affected obviously by a certain social climate but is at the same time a, a complicated relationship and not univocus. Sometimes intense, sometimes intimate, many, m m many times inconstant and ephemeral. Sometimes we find ourselves in front of young people who have um, a, a relationship that ha a short-term relationship with the church. During teen the teenage years, this relationship, in many cases, uh, begins to break, begins to become weaker. So. This relationship is, we shouldn't hide this problem uh, or not speak about it. It's clear that it has been damaged, the relationship with, between young people and the church. All this should make us reflect profoundly and ask certain questions as pastors, as families, as lay people. At the basis, we have a great and unresolved educational problem, problem of education, an education to faith, to the value of life, and to knowing how to live in a community. More than ever today, we are asked by the church to go towards young people. Modern man, as Paulo VI said, modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. In 1969, 
maybe 1970, with a group of young people of Florence from Giorgio La Pira, we went to listen to Pope Paul VI. They were, there were a lot of young people, and that this was, these were very difficult times. Uh, just after 19, the challenges of 1968, thankfully then Pope John Paul II also helped us to emerge from this, these difficult times. But these young people came together, and Pope Paul VI uh, spoke to the vice mayor of Florence, uh, the former mayor. He asked, what are the points that are given in the educational uh, aims uh, um, destined in this, the program for these young people. La Pira, the former mayor, replied that young people were living in a world where there was a, a, a strong wind of secularization. He spoke without uh, hesit hesitating of Christ, of the purity of those uh, young people spoke uh, uh, to the former mayor about the purity of Mary and without any difficulty of Christ. It became a sort of a public discussion between La Pira and the bishops and the popes. They say that history is the teacher of life. Either history is a bad teacher or she has terrible students because something is not working. Then the Pope became extremely serious and he said, I often wonder what future men will say about uh, the church of our times. There was a moment of silence. And then the Pope replied, I hope that in 2014, 2050, those coming after us will be able to say that church had many issues, that church was suffering, but with all of its strength, it was a church that loved men. I think that this is what is asked of our generation too. That was a church that didn't close its gates. It went towards people and loved people. I see so many, so much light in the words of Paul VI. And I wonder, has this prophecy become true? Is it becoming true? And if this prophecy has to be fulfilled, who are responsible for this? Who have to fulfill it? It's especially you, through your actions, through your life, through your experiences. If everyone coming after us, seeing 
all this could say, well, that was a problematic generation, but it didn't become closed, it didn't close its gates. Instead, it tried to love profoundly, to love men profoundly. That would be great. I believe that this is our calling. And I also believe that you're given many talents by God. Uh, I'm uh, quite old fashioned, sorry. God gives you many talents so that this can become true. This is your calling. God gives you the tools. God doesn't give you just a talent. He doesn't even give you two or five talents. You have many more talents. And I could prove this to you because I've been an educator my whole life. I was educator in the seminar for 22 years preparing young people for priesthood. And all the young students, they were also different. Because God doesn't have molds. They were all so different and they had so many talents. One of them is here today, Father Andrea, who is Archbishop in Salerno. Isn't it true, Andrea? Stand up. Stand up. They were different from one another. They were united, yes, but so different. You, Andrea, were so different from Paolo. Paolo was different from Giovanni. And you're different from Milo. The God, uh, God is amazing when he gives everyone a different talent. You have so many more talents than what you think. And I'm here to say, guys, come on. This is the synod. Let's use our talents. Let's not hide them like the one who was afraid. Fear can create many problems. Fear means paralysis because we stop being open. Instead, we need to find our talents and let your priests help you in this. You can go to someone and say, I cannot understand what my talent is. Can you please help me? Find someone who can go through life with you. When in 1979, I went to the Seminario Maggiore and uh, the guys from, the boys from Don Andrea's class entered about 15 people. I had never seen so many young people and they were all 19. I was 37 and I had been called by Cardinal Belenli who said, uh, go and be a guide for these young men. I, uh, I had never had so much fear in my life before. And I'm speaking the truth. And the cardinal asked, what's wrong with you? I replied, well, I'm, I'm not good enough. I don't have the spiritual preparation. And the cardinal said, well, they study, they study theology. They already have teachers. And I asked, but what can I teach them? And the cardinal looked at me smiling. I remember this. He died too soon at 69. He would have, he had so much more to give to the church. He smiled and said, 
you don't have to give them anything. Just bring them the joy and enthusiasm of your priesthood. Literally, just a bit of joy, a bit of enthusiasm, a bit of fire. And I did have this inside of me. And I brought this to them. But then the cardinal became, became more serious. And I did. He used the word that now the Pope frequently uses. He used the word guidance. He said, do not stand in front of them, because otherwise you show them the way. But they are younger than you. Their ra radar is stronger than yours. They can find the way. They will show you the way. And I remembered a quote from Lapira when he said that young people are like swallows flying towards uh, spring. They can always find the way. So he said, they will show you the way, so do not stand in front of them. But also, do not stand behind them, because otherwise they could fall down a slope or fall down a ditch. Instead, stand next to them. Be a guide for them. And this is what I wish for all of you. Stand next to each other. Support each other. Become... Uh, stand next to ma many more people. Accompany as many people as you can. We don't need more teachers. We need witnesses. People who believe in what they say. And people who are willing to take others by the hand. Just to, to conclude, God is the author of youth, and he works in many different ways. Youth is a blessed time. Youth is a joy, but does an old person, an 83-year-old like me, have to say this? You have to say this. You have to see that youth is a joy. He added, youth is a song of hope. Youth is bliss. Don't consider it just a temporary time in your life. May it be like the fire that warms up your life and everyone's around you, the life of everyone around you. I went to visit uh, Tonino Bello's grave in the region of Apulia, in Santa Maria di Leuca. And I'd like to conclude with one of his quotes. When I went there, while I was uh, blessing his grave, one of his last students, who's now a bishop, said, God gave men just one wing, but you cannot go anywhere with just one wing. But why did God give men just one wing? So that men fly all together. So if two come together, then they can fly. I had this dream. But the dream is even better because I saw that behind all these people there was Jesus. Even he had just one wing. Do you know why? Because he wants to fly with us. Thank you very much.
Ähm. I would like to briefly thank you, Your Eminence. I'm not used to this. I'm used to being with young people. And you truly described my heart, the heart of my young people, with the w wisdom and truth that really moved me. So I, I, d I really do thank you. What comes to mind is a sentence of Don Giussani about youth. For many, youth is a transitional period, but it is actually a fundamental period in one's life. In youth, a confused youth, comes the time for the other with the capital O, of which one is constituted. And youth is the time of the U with a capital Y in which the heart sinks as into an abyss. It is the time of God. Thank you very much. We have perceived today that our time is the relationship between God and our heart. Loved and revered by God himself. Thank you. I leave you by saying that the meeting is a unique event. As you can see, as you, as you know, after 40 years made up of the contribution of many volunteers, many donators and sponsors. So I ask you, when you have the chance to help with a donation, you will see the possibility outside the conference halls at the stands, the possibility to the chance to contribute to this event, which involves and has to do with Italy and the world, the whole world itself. Thank you.